Welcome to True Crime 101 with Murder Friends, the podcast where three friends from three different countries talk murder. My name's Anna, and I'm American. I'm Alana, and I'm Canadian. My name's Hannah, and I'm British. In addition to our longer episodes, True Crime 101 talks you through key true crime cases. So I want to ask you guys if you've ever heard of the Scarsdale Diet. No. 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 Okay. It's kind of a well-known diet. Um, It is a really strict eating plan that allows for only 1,000 calories per day, regardless of your body size, gender, activity level. Um, There's no substitutions of any kind are allowed, and each meal is sort of like specifically designed, like defined for like one of those 14 days of the diet. Hannah's face is like, where are you going with this? A thousand (laughs) calories. I know. Um, Yeah, it's it's horrendous. It's so stupid. It's just a stupid, stupid diet. So it was created by a man named Dr. Herman Tarnauer. I'm only doing cases with a Herman in it from now on. And it was created in 1979, okay? So it's like one of those old school ones when they're just like, yeah, eat a grapefruit and do some cocaine, basically. (laughs) It's like one of those. Uh, (laughs) They're like, you're losing so much weight. I wish I was back then. (laughs) I know. (laughs) So it's like, it's quite similar to like keto before keto. Um, It's just eliminating carbs for like a slow and painful death. Yeah. So like day one of the diet is like half a grapefruit, (laughs) Um, one slice of protein bread, but no butter and coffee. No, You can have coffee or tea, but no sugar, cream or milk. So black coffee, half a grapefruit and one slice of whatever the protein bread is. Sad bread. Then for lunch, this is like day one. So then you can have some assorted cold cuts, like, I don't know, some ham or something, chicken, um, some tomatoes, and black coffee or tea. <laughs> then for dinner, you can have fish or, self- or shellfish, mixed salad, and one slice of protein bread. That's what I like. Basically, that whole day is what I eat for like breakfast. So I don't think... I would have done well. Now, whilst this diet is definitely a crime in its own right, but it's not really like enough for true crime 101. So, oh, the segue. Yeah. Yeah. So, So I'm going to tell you a little more about Dr. Herman Tarnauer. So, he was born in 1910 in Brooklyn, New York, to Jewish immigrant parents Harry and Dora Tarnauer. Now, Herman was always a driven man from a young age. His father had a prosperous hat manufacturing business. And I wrote in, like, brackets, like, it was the 30s, so, like, everybody wore a hat. <laughs> like, hats were a thing. Um, but, like, he insisted that um, he didn't want to be a part of the business, and he went, decided to study medicine. So he attended Syracuse and graduated in 1933. He then began his regi- residency at Bellevue and went on to fellowship studying abroad, um, studying cardiology in L- London and Amsterdam. And in 1939, he returned stateside and got a job as an attending cardiologist at White Plains Hospital. And then the end of the war, um, he-, he ended up having to go into the military or participate in it, and the war found him a lieutenant colonel stationed in Japan. So he was a member of the Casualty Survey Commission. So that's horrible. So if you can imagine, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you were there dealing with the aftermath of that. So that's, like, genuinely horrific, and that experience really affected him, and he would often, like, speak about this experience, which totally understandable. So in due course, the war ends, and uh, Herman returns to White Plains Hospital, he moved to Scarsdale, New York. So he was the founder of the Scarsdale Medical Group and a lifelong bachelor and was a known sort of like ladies man. <laughs> and he was just literally like he always just had different girlfriends and everyone just knew he just never settled down and got married. And I imagine that was like a bit even more probably like less um, of a thing that it is more so now because like everybody sort of got married, didn't they? His career progressed, and he eventually met a woman named Jean Harris. So I'm going to talk about Jean. We're going to talk about her for a little bit. Jean Struven was born in 1924 and grew up in the fashionable Cleveland suburb of Shaker Heights. Her family was really well off, and she was educated at a private school. Um, She was very ambitious, organized, um, really personable, she graduated magna cum laude. Shortly thereafter, she married the son of a Detroit industrialist named James Harris. But her father openly <laughs> disproved of James. She just he just did not think that James was like good enough for her. <laughs> he even like cried. He like weeped 
at their wedding oh <laughs> openly. <my God>. Like <laughs> so dramatic. So dramatic, right? Okay, so I mean, it's not really like a just not really a good way to start your marriage, is it? So they settle in Gross Point, Michigan. Now, the Harris has moved into, like, a colonial-style house in Hillcrest and Gross Point. Um, it's a really middle-class, picturesque neighborhood. And in 1946, uh, four months after marriage, Jean began teaching history and current events at Gross Point Country Day School, um, which is an elementary school. So her father didn't approve of this either. So I don't really think he was very keen that she was, like, working at all. As back then, it still was, like... Starting out, like, you know, she's married now. She's supposed to be a homemaker. Her husband should have this great job and take care of her and give her the life that she's used to. But that just wasn't the case. She genuinely wanted a career. So she did take some time off to raise her sons. Um, David was born in 1950, and James was born 24 months later. But she then re- went back to school and remained teaching there for a few years. But a colleague at the school said that Harris was very ambitious and wanted to be much more than just a first grade teacher. So James Harris, meantime, had also taken a job as a supervisor at the Harley, Holly Carpenter Company. I don't really know what they actually did. I couldn't figure out what they did. But it was a decent job, but he just wasn't ambitious. Um, a neighbor said that James Harris wasn't as forceful as she was, but a lot more fun to be with. <laughs> Harsh. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and she's like, I liked him a lot. All I'm saying is that everyone loved him. She, um, they said Jean Harris was very pretty and very brilliant, but everyone loved him. He was, the, he was a nice, quiet man. And I was like, right. So she just, yeah, he was quiet. So everyone just got on with him because he didn't say much. All right. Nice. So Jean spent the next few years getting her master's degree, but by 1964, she's tired of her life and her marriage in Michigan. Turns out her dad, I think, was a little bit right. You know, it just, he, the man she married just wasn't sort of up to what she had hoped her life would be. So especially um, she, after she meets an old friend named Marge Jacobson. Again, that's another name we just like don't hear anymore. Marge. Bring it back. Mm. Let's bring that one back. Herman, Marge. Do you know what? Side note. Somebody, I think, on our YouTube commented. They, like, looked up how many people were named Herman, like, back then. <laughs> like, in the stats. Like, I think I was like, that's impressive. Do you, you know, know every year are. they have, like, the baby names of, like, how there was, yeah. like, no Garys born in, like, 2000 or something. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, I wonder how many Hermans were born, like, last year. I know. It was amazing. Probably none, because, like... <laughs> oh, none. we're bringing it I back, hope bitch. I <laughs> <laughs> no. um, so Marge is married to a lawyer in New York City, and they have an apartment on Park Avenue and a home in Scarsdale, and she decides that, like, she sees her, and she's just like, oh, that's amazing, and she just doesn't want to be married to James anymore. So she files her divorce and wants to get out of the Midwest and change her life completely. She decides she wants to be with someone who is ambitious and wealthy. So she and her sons move to a suburb of Philadelphia, and after Jean accepts a job as a director of an affluent private school, so she's also moving up in her career, uh, she settles into her life, and she reaches out to Marge again, and um, I'm, for those who are not familiar with the States, like, it's not too far to go to, from f- Philadelphia to New York, but it's still, it's not that close. So Marge invites her to a party she's throwing um, at her New York City apartment. Um, so this is our meet cute. So in walks... <laughs> Dr. Herman Tarnauer. So she's smitten straight away. Um, they hit it off and they had a good conversation. And she was she was smart, so Herman was also drawn to her. And at the time, Jean was in her 40s and Herman was in his 50s. And I think most of the time he went out with like sort of a lot of the sort of bimbo type. I don't know. Um, so the, this was a bit different for him because he could have like really good conversation with her. So after they met that evening, Jean started receiving little cards and presents, and this began a long-distance 14-year relationship. At first, Herman took her to fancy dinners and out on the town and to dinner parties, and he even brought her into his, like, circle of friends. Um, He had many wealthy friends and patients, and for Jean, this is exactly what she had wanted. Like, this is what she was looking for. She's hit the jackpot. So in 1967, Herman proposed to Jean, and she was, like, over the moon. She wanted to wait for a little bit so that her sons could just finish up school so she didn't relocate to New York and, like, upheaval, you know, put them into upheaval again. But after a few months went on and Herman never seemed to, like, set a date. And then one day he finally, like, broke down and was just like, well, 
I actually can't go through with it. I can't get married. Because obviously he'd been a bachelor for that long and he just sort of like reneged on his proposal. <laughs> Ouch. Ooh. Yeah, really harsh. So um, Jean thought that maybe he just isn't the marrying type and so she posted the ring back to him. But this made him angry and he drove all the way to Philadelphia to give it back to her. Um, he wanted her to wear the ring. You will see now, like Herman was a massive fuckboy in today's terms, okay? He was actually like pretty awful with women. Um, so Jean gets mad, but they do make up eventually and Jean is just so desperate to make it work because this is her perfect man. She's met him. Um, She wants to be with Herman, so she always just kind of lets things, um, she just takes a lot of stuff that she shouldn't. Like, you just would be like, girl, find someone else. Like, he's awful. He is trash. Yeah, now it would have been, like, in the group chat being like, what the fuck are you playing at? He's a dickhead. (laughs) Yeah. Dump his ass. Exactly. (laughs) We've all had, like, conversations like that. There'd be, like, (laughs) screenshots of his conversations with her being posted in the group. Like, it's, you know, he drove to Philadelphia to post me the ring back. What a psycho. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So around this time, though, like, Jean injures her back. So back injury and this, my friends, is where the pill addiction enters the story. Ooh. All right, so Jean and Herman, they did continue to see each other. And Herman took Jean on trips and continued to have her, like, as a long-distance girlfriend. But he was obviously seeing other women. Jean was miserable trying to be okay with him, like, not being faithful and serious about their relationship. But all the while, it was really, like, killing her inside. So she was just really unhappy. Jean accepted a new job in Connecticut, which was great for her because it meant she'd be closer to Herman. Colleagues from the school said that that her behavior was starting to be erratic and she had a short fuse. At this point, she was taking sleeping pills at night and amphetamines during the day. Um, Her mental health was not great between the relationship troubles and the drug problem and the pressures from her job. So around this time, Herman starts to see his 34-year-old secretary named Lynn. He starts to play the two against each other. And this is like, this this is horrible. He basically thought they'd both try harder to please him. Like, if he pitted them against each other. So, like, oh they knew about God. each other, and he did it on purpose. It's like the Hunger like, Games for Herman. Yeah, yeah. So the Herman for Games. Herman. <laughs> Hunger Games for Herman. <laughs> 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 exactly. So, like, they would leave harassing messages on each other's answering machines, and it was just it was just pushing Jean further and further, like, to the edge. Like, she's just not having it. And then in 1977, Jean was now 54 years old and offered the headmistress position at a really prestigious private school in McLean, Virginia. Her first year wasn't great. She replaced a really beloved headmistress and was not so well liked by the students. Then it rolls over to 1978 and Jean decides to buy a gun. So um, at the time, she was suicidal and she bought it because I think she just was, 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 thinking she was unhappy and wanted to take her own life. And she wasn't, she didn't, um, you know, she wanted to have Herman to herself. So then 1979 is when the Scarsdale Diet book came out. So obviously what I talked about in the beginning of the story, the diet was, so it was the beginning of Herman becoming an instant celebrity. Because you know you have these big diets that come out and they do all the talk show circuits, which he did then. And so whatever the talk shows were back then, he was doing them. And obviously it made him wealthier and more famous. And he was, you know, it was, his life was just amazing. But Jean was very upset because Jean actually helped write most of the book. In fact, she kind of like wrote a lot of it. Um, And Herman came up with the diet. But Jean, you know, did all the wording and like the whole, you know, did all of it. But she was not even given any credit at all. Like she should be a co-author. But none like she's kind of mentioned in the back like with thanks to Jean Harris like that's it the bitch wrote the book right so he sends her a check for four grand and was like thanks bitch I don't know if those were exact words but that's what I'm picturing and this made her even more upset and mad I mean as you would she didn't want a job she just did it because she loved him so it wasn't you know didn't need to do this so after this Lynn became the main girlfriend so secretary Lynn is sort of like going more on the trips and there for the holidays and the more exciting things. Um, And then there were rumors that Herman was actually going to propose. So at the same time, she was having further issues at her job. She expelled some students near to their graduation for 
weed possession. And the faculty and the parents were kind of mad at her, thinking, like, it wasn't really necessary. She needed to expel them. And so she even received, like, this really terrible letter from a student about how much they hated her and all that. So this was, like, the last straw for Jane. Everything had been piling up on her and she just lost it. So she is also withdrawing from the amphetamines she'd been taking because she didn't have a prescription because she'd run out and she'd been trying to reach Herman for three days to write her another prescription. Because I don't know if I mentioned, actually I didn't mention that earlier, but he had been giving her the prescriptions for the pills. So he wouldn't answer. He was ignoring her and she really needed the prescription badly. She then decided to write Herman this 10 page letter (laughs) Oh, honey, no. Like, I know. Mm. On the horrible way he treated her over the years. And, of course, you know, can you imagine, like, now you write, like, a text message you might spend an hour looking at and rereading or an email or something, and it's, like, instant, and then you can delete it, really. Sometimes you can delete it if it hasn't already. But then when you post it, like, that's three days, four days. So you're like, shit. <laughs> like, by day three, you're like, <sighs> I've cooled down now, and, like, I can't get that letter back. (laughs) Like, um, yikes. As she was writing the letter, she also decided to write her will. Um, On March 10th, 1980, she finally reaches Herman and begs him not to read the letter (laughs) and tries to explain how she was feeling with all this stress, and she asks him if she could come and see him. She needs to come and see him that night. I have to come. And he said he was having dinner with his niece, and that, come tomorrow. Um, But she decides she's going to go, and she's going to drive to New York that night. And so she grabs her gun. She puts on her mink coat. Hell she yeah. gets in the car with the gun and the mink coat. Now that is a look. Like if you're in a rage and you're going to go kill some guy, the mink coat is definitely – I just can picture it. You know when like someone drives like this in like yeah. an old movies? But they all drive like this. Yeah. You can't see me. But you know they like move their hands back and forth like a lot? Like nowadays you barely like touch the wheel. No, not then. All right, so then she drives five hours in the pouring rain. Oh, my God. Big coat, everything. Okay, she arrives at 10.40 p.m., and Herman is asleep because he's an old man at this point, so 10.40, he's out. I mean, same. (laughs) Um, She wakes him up, and he's really annoyed to be woken up, and Jean goes to the bathroom, and she sees Lynn's nightgown and curlers, and this is when she loses her shit. She hurls the curls across the room, and Herman then slaps Jean, and he yells for her to get out. She then pulls out the gun, and her and Herman wrestle for the gun, and he was then shot through the hand. So Herman was able to buzz his housekeeper, Suzanne, and she could hear Jean scream and a gunshot. Three more shots were fired at close range. Jean then put the gun to her head, and it clicked. So she then tried to kill herself, but the gun malfunctioned. She then pointed it towards the closet, and it fired... So then she tried to shoot herself again, and it clicked. Didn't work again. I know. So she decided she has to get out of the house. She gets in her car and starts driving, but she passes police cars coming towards the house, so she decides that she's going to turn around and go back. Um, Obviously, the housekeeper had called the police. Once she gets there, she says to the police that Herman has been shot, and she went up to Herman's bedroom, and the police officers and his housekeepers were already there and told police Jean had done it. So, Jean claimed the whole thing was a mistake, that this was really a suicide attempt gone wrong. She said it was a struggle for the gun, and this is what she would say in court for her defense. The prosecution thinks she shot him at point blank on purpose. It's all, um, she's never admitted to doing it on purpose. I mean, it doesn't look good. So, there was, this was like a huge media circus around this whole case, because you think, this guy's actually famous at this point, <laughs> and... She was, like, from a rich family, and she was a successful head teacher of a school, and so it was a really, really sensationalized, like, big deal. The prosecution actually offered her a plea of manslaughter, but she refused and wanted to fight it in court. So, during the trial, she wore fancy dresses and coats to court every day, and even took the stand to explain the mental abuse she had suffered by Herman, still claiming she had just wanted to kill herself. Do you remember that 10-page letter that she wrote and, like, mailed... To Herman, Mm -hmm. like begged him not to read it. Well, he didn't read it, but it was read to the entire court. (gasps) All 10 pages. Oh my God. (laughs) The ultimate shame. Yeah. And it really didn't do her any favors because it really showed how mad she was at him. (laughs) Yeah. So Jean Harris was, of course, found guilty of second degree murder and sentenced to 15 years in prison. Uh, While she was in prison, she wrote two books, though. 
A Stranger in Two Worlds, a memoir, and they always call us ladies. Um, she got very much into prison reform. Um, and she was actually released from prison at age 69 in 1993. And she went on to do talk shows after her release. Um, and then she eventually died in two, 2012. But she, like I said, went on. She's a very educated woman. She went to write the books and just advocate for prison reform for women. Um, and she's always stand by the uh, her what she said, that it was just sort of like a self-defense. It was she meant to commit suicide and he wrestled it away. And that was that. So that is the story of Jean Harris and the Doctor. Wow, I never heard of that before. I hadn't either, but actually, there's actually a lot of stuff out there. It's a quite a bit because it was such a big case. Um, I got a, had a lot of sources. New York Magazine. There was a TV show I watched called Murder Made Me Famous. <laughs> Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, is that like a is that like a cheesy thing, or is that actually like was it just a one no, off on like, her? Is you know like one of those ones. About- is- those ones that are on the like ID channel. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they're just loads of them. Oh, there's one on the ID channel called um, Killer Siblings, and I am fucking obsessed. Oh, right. <laughs> exactly. We'll yeah. yeah we'll it's along that sort of line. Um, but yes, obviously, I will put all of my sources on the website. There's quite a lot out there, um, like I said, because it was such a publicized case. I thought it was going to be that he f- formulated a diet and she went on it, and because it was only a thousand calories, she went mental. And just like lost her crap and just shot him for it. Because that's, I, I, I could imagine if someone put me on a restrictive diet that badly, I would turn to murder. Yeah, absolutely. Same. A thousand calories, homicidal. please. Nothing. That's like less than a toddler eats, right? Yeah, it's not good. No one should be eating a thousand calories a day. That's just, that's just ridiculous. Um, and obviously, it just, <laughs> it's not a popular diet any longer. <laughs> but apparently, in fact, anyone out there, it's actually not good to, to, to follow diets from doctors, if I'm honest, because that isn't their specialty. Uh, always go with a nutritionist or a dietitian. But for some reason, diets like, or doctors like to put out diets. It's like... Well, it makes money, yeah, I guess. not a good idea. Mm. Yeah. That's great, though. I had no idea how that was going to end in terms of I thought he was going to, like, off her or something because he wanted to get with, the, mm. with someone new, right? Like, get, new ri- get rid yeah. of the, the girlfriend to get the new girlfriend. So, yeah, that was a shocker. Yeah, it was kind of one of those ones that could go many a different ways because you have got the other woman, the way he was just such an asshole to her, and the drug addiction. addiction. Which he facilitated. Yeah. Which he facilitated, exactly. So... So many things there. This is just like a modern day fuckboy story or like a olden day fuckboy story. Yeah. Like <laughs> nowadays, like he said, we would have had like the other things about in the group chat and even like we wouldn't have sent a 10 page letter by post. It would have been like. <laughs> it would have been like your friends like, oh, I'm, I've written this 10 page letter and we all would have been like, no, honey. No, 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 no. Honey, no, baby, no, baby, no, 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 no. don't do that. <laughs> we would have talked you out of it before you posted it. <laughs> so Good. There's also a movie called Mrs. Harris. That came out in 2005, and Tarnow was played by Ben Kingsley, and Jean Harris was Annette, was played by Annette Bening. Oh. No, yeah, so check that movie out. And I'm going to post pictures, because let me just tell you, Herman lives up to his name, okay? He wasn't like, he was this playboy, but he wasn't like some, you know, gorgeous man, that doctor that, like, women were just, you know, fawning over, so... Yeah. Anyway, check our socials for that. But um, thank you for listening today. I think that's about it. Um, you can check out our website, murderfriends.com. Email murderfriendspod at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter, murderfriendspd, and Instagram, murderfriendspod. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.